but now I can't find it. And I do. Dear God. Um, struggling with the issues of women and marginalized groups within our community. We always wonder why these issues, um, these people in our group are shunned and um, are never welcome in our groups. And we hope to make wigs something that can um, help uh, gain awareness with that and a lot more um, and maybe cause some change with it. Um, Jamin Warren was, is a, a former reporter for the Washington, um, Wall, Street, uh, Wall Street Journal. I can't talk right now, very early. Uh, he's also the founder and CEO of um, Kill Screen, which is a very popular um, online magazine and um, other things that he'll probably explain. <laughs> um, and now he is also the host of um, YouTube's PBS game show channel and with a hundred or more videos under his belt. Um, we hope that we can um, find some new paths to understand what we can do with our community to make it more welcoming and inviting. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Jamin Warren to the presentation. Um, so as mentioned, I am the, uh, the founder of a video game arts and culture company called Kill Screen. Um, I initially started my career at the Wall Street Journal. Um, I was hired in 2006 to cover arts and entertainment for them. And they gave me this really, really wide range of things that I could write about. Uh, it was me and this other reporter named John, who are ostensibly culture reporters. So this gave me all kinds of flexibility. So I, covered uh, sort of the burgeoning social web, for example. This is a story that I filed a couple of many, many years ago, how Facebook plans to catch my space. So I don't know if that uh, actually happened or not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not a fortune teller, unfortunately. Um, but I, I wrote about a lot of different things. Um, I traveled to North Carolina once to write about this group. It was called the Bounce. Bulldogs, they're a jump roping team that was planning to face off against uh, the Japanese at the Apollo Theater in Harlem. I'm not making this up. Um, I wrote about the people who made gold records back when that was a thing and music still sold. Um, so I covered a lot of different things. <laughs> um, but there are two things I've done my entire life. One was read and the other one was play video games. And so I started to get back into the world of games. This would have been around 2008. And uh, my, my initial foray in the games it really opened my eyes. Um, not only was there a much wider variety of games than I remembered when I was a kid, uh, but the types of subjects that they were covering was much more, I don't know, much more reflective of who I was as an adult. So you had games like Bioshock, for example, which, you know, on the one hand is, you know, maybe like a run-of-the-mill first-person shooter, but it deals with some larger questions about ethics and moral choice. Uh, and then you had a lot of smaller games as well. Um, like this one, which is called Braid, uh, which is sort of a love letter to early NES games, but it 
again, it's a, sort of an exploration into meaning and loss. Um, again, this is all being told through video games, and the idea that video games could do something uh, impactful and culturally meaningful was completely new to me. Um, so it was like my childhood had suddenly grown up with me. So I filed this big, I, I, I sit down, and I'm like, all right, I really want to start covering video games for the Wall Street Journal. No one's really writing about them as a form of culture, um, even though all different types of things. And so I read this really long, like five page document, delivered to my editor. And he tells me, I don't get this video game thing. And then they shuttled me off to this other cultural backwater, which was television at the time. Um, so, uh, you know, I felt like there was a, you know, a big barrier because I felt like what I was seeing in the world of games was, um, was a medium that was commercially incredibly successful. Um, you know, at, the, at the time, Grand Theft Auto 4, uh, I guess it you know, set all kinds of sales records. It sold you know, over 3.6 million copies in its first week. It generated a quarter billion dollars in sales. And that was back in 2008. And then you know, the next Grand Theft Auto sets a you know, billion dollars. And now it's you know, Grand Theft Auto and Call of Duty go back and forth each year for how much they sell. And it's way more than any other medium. Uh, it's three times the single day movie grows for the Death the Hollows. Although I guess Jury is seven, maybe. I think that might be the new. Has anybody seen that yet? That's one of my favorite movies right now. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, if you look at like Backstreet Boys in the late 90s, they sold $20 million so, uh, in a single week. So games were this incredibly um, you know, commercially viable medium, and yet I felt like. The paper that I worked at, which you know, was this big, you know, national, international paper, wasn't really interested in engaging in games that way. So I started, um, I started Kill Screen initially as a print magazine to try and explore some of these larger questions about what games could be. Um, so we run a print magazine, we run a website, uh, we have something called Playlist where we highlight uh, different games each week, which we think are, are really cool. We have a festival, which is actually coming up in a couple weeks, where we look at games and culture. And then, of course, I host a PBS game show. And we've done a bunch of other really cool projects. Um, that was for a music festival, a project that we did, and we worked with Pitchfork on a project called Soundplay, building games with musicians. So when I think a lot about what it is that I do, and when I describe to people what it is that I do, I tell them I work at a video game arts and culture company. And usually they stop because that word, I don't think it's because of the arts part. I think people are much more willing now, now at the Smithsonian and the Museum of Modern Art, and taking you know, games and put them in you know, next to you know, great works of art. I think the arts piece is a little bit easier for people to understand. But it's the culture piece that I think is really confusing for a lot of people. And I think that culture piece is really, really important. Because when I think about what the future of games is, I don't think it's technology. I think it's culture. And it's interesting, you know, earlier you all were kind of talking about your thoughts and ideas and the things you wanted to discuss. And for the most part, the things you were interested in were these big cultural questions about where games fit into sort of our larger everyday life. Um, so what is that? So what does that mean? Um, now, the, the initial pitch for me when I started Kill Screen was this idea that we would do something that was really, really smart. And uh, you know, and at the time, there wasn't a lot of like really intelligent stuff that was being done about games. And so I really wanted to explore this word culture because that's the one that was most interesting to me. And I also feel like it's the most unexplored. Um, I think that recently we had a great example of like why the word video games and culture ha are, have been problematic for quite some time. And you probably all know um, what this is. How, how many of you know what Gamergate is? Just out of curiosity. Um, for those who don't know, it kind of, you know, Gamergate initially started as um, a lover's quarrel, which then became a crusade against women in games, and then kind of became an online crusade against women in general, and then became a lot of traffic for a lot of different websites. Um, and I, you know, I think what's interesting about sort of Gamergate was that I don't think it's a moral or technical failure. Obviously, you know, the social systems that we inhabit, things like Twitter and Facebook, don't always do a good job of protecting us, but I think it's a cultural failure, and specifically that I think that the public's imagination is so warped by the idea of what games are, 
that allowed this really um, this really venomous seed to sort of take root. All of a sudden, you have these people who maybe shouldn't have microphones. All of a sudden, they take on this much larger, larger importance. So that's why. So that's why I think that the cultural piece is incredibly important when we think about games. Um, and so I, I'm, you know, I think, and that's why I have demonstrating a diversity of game playing experiences is incredibly important because we can have all kinds of technological advances in terms of like cinematic realism in games or whatever, but if the culture around games doesn't really change, then um, we're going to be sort of left in the dust. Um, so that's what I'm going to spend the bulk of my talk talking about is kind of how, two different things. One is sort of how the culture of games hasn't really been very welcoming to the to, to women and how that the same tools that build upon these negative aspects of gaming culture can also be the seeds of change as well. Um, so let me back up one second. Um, so we, I, I, we sort of need to have like a definition, kind of like of what culture is, because it's a term that a lot of us use a lot of times, but we don't always know exactly what it means. Um, so this is uh, George Sybil. He's a uh, he was a, a turn of the century, turn of the twentieth century uh, sociologist, and he came up with this uh, definition of culture, and he said that the cultivation uh, culture it refers to the cultivation of individuals through agency of external forms which has been objectified through the course of history, which is very, very complicated. So I broke it down into three different ways. We can think about culture in three different ways. That culture is ways of thinking, culture is ways of acting, and culture is ways of objecting or working with objects themselves. So I'm going to start with, so if we think about culture this way, then we can start to see how uh, games culture has sort of not really carved a place through these different forms uh, for women and how we can use those tools to change these things as well. Um, so how does um, so how does the way we think about games sort of prevent like larger equality? So I want to do like a little thought experiment. So if you close your eyes, for example, if you close your eyes and like I said the word gamer, like what would be the first thing that popped to mind? A bit of an association experiment. Um, would it be the image on the left or would it be the image on the right? Because I think for a lot of people, um, even if you're not the person on the left, that's generally what we think of who gamers are. Uh, and, and then you, if you spend time online, or if you go to gaming conventions, you'll find other people who seek out your passion. Maybe you'll find more people like Aisha Tyler, who's one of the voices on the show called Archer, and she's someone who loves games, but people don't necessarily think of her, quote unquote, as a gamer. And there's some reasons why we tend to think of you know, this person on the left as opposed to this person on the right when we think about games. Um, in the early 80s, there was a Polish social psychologist, his name was Henry Tajafel, and um, he encountered something called in-group favoritism. And what that means is that we tend to favor people um, in our group because groups give us both identity and self-esteem. So, um, I don't know, I guess maybe for you all, like someone from Appleton might think of themselves as being different from someone from Green Bay, right? Um, or you might think about the differences between, uh, you know, obviously between between different genders or between different races. Um, but the, this idea that we have groups and that's how we think of home, it's really, really important. And uh, it turns out that this idea of like what your group is, is pretty loose. Like he found that Tajbal could, he could split the people in the groups based on a coin toss. And, like you're the heads people and you're the tails people. And the heads people would still favor the people who would flip the coin heads and the tails people would flip, uh, favor the people who flip the coin tails. It's a very meaningless distinction and yet this idea that we want a sense of belonging is incredibly, incredibly powerful. Uh, and so you see that a lot in games and I think one of the reasons why we've seen a lot of sort of this negative behavior um, around people who you know claim to be game players is this other side of, in these two sides, one is in-group favoritism, which is that you like the people who are sort of like you, no matter how small those, uh, the, those similarities might be, but it turns out that the opposite is true, and he called it out-group derogation, which basically just means anyone who doesn't share those characteristics with you, um, it, you're going to be very, very defensive. And so that's a lot of what happened, uh, that's been happening over the past couple of years in the world of games. The perception is, amongst you know, people who are call themselves gamers, is that there are these people from the outside, and they're telling you that this castle that you've built has some structural flaws. And so what do you do? You rally your own, you get really defensive, and you defend your tribe to death. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, games, the problem is that I think that games actually, by virtue of what they 
are sometimes reinforce how these groups work. Uh, and they, I think they do this in two ways. One is simply the games themselves. Um, you know, there's a lot of games that you know include a lot of violence, and a lot of games that I genuinely enjoy and played as a kid. Um, but there's some other more pernicious ways that this happens. Um, obviously, the overreliance on first-person shooters is one. But some of it is that um, is that games reinforce uh, they reinforce this in other ways uh, because they allow certain groups to oh, sorry they allow certain groups to exist. Uh, let's see. There we go. All right, cool. This is a game called Rust. Um, it's a uh, you know, it's a pretty popular online PC game. Um, and you know, one of the, Rust to sort of build itself, and you see a lot of games that do this, it builds itself as being this place with no rules, right? You drop people into this environment, and they can kind of do whatever they want. And it sort of reflects this bias that a lot of game designers have, which is that, which that they would never, they would rather not define a certain set of like social rules or mores in terms of what people can and can't do. So in a game like Rust, it was pretty natural then that you had this group, it was uh, this brotherhood of uh, naked warriors, they all gathered together, it's all these naked guys that got together. And this is something that the game allows you to do. And uh, so as a result, you end up, yeah. <laughs> so it's one of things by building a system where there are no rules, you allow people to sort of um, create rules in and of themselves. So Esther McCallum, she's a, um, she's a researcher and a game designer. And she said that you know game designers would rather not prevent people from doing things like this. They would rather not define codes of behavior in an online world because then they feel like that would disenfranchise the multiplicity of players who want to have other types of experiences. Um, so there's no law inside a lot of different types of games other than the law that players try to create for themselves. And you know, on face, these things don't seem bad. They seem silly, right? It's kind of goofy. It's not that big of a deal. But in practice, I think it does create this identity or this idea amongst games that games can and should be these like laissez-faire environments where anything goes. So we shouldn't be surprised then that if you know game designers create these systems that allow people to do anything, that that type of mentality starts to leak out into the wider world. Um, so how do games? How do games? The way that people act in the world of games um, disenfranchise women. Well, you know, if you look at sort of the early, early history of games, um, it's really sad, but sexism is really baked into uh, baked into the early games from the start. Even with you know you think like early. Like um, like Pong, these are you know these are the founders of Atari, um, and Atari when it was started, it was um, started you know as an antidote to other types of San Francisco tech culture. So they housed themselves in Berkeley. They were meant to be an antidote to like IBM. They had tattoos and motorcycles, and the idea was that they were supposed to reflect this free willing culture of, of California in the '70s. And so um, you know there was. You know, drug use in the office. It was meant to be this really kind of like cool environment. And there's this story that someone has about so that guy in the middle, his name is Nolan Bushnell, the guy with the polka dot shirt and the very, very wide tie. Um, there's this story where um, he was interviewing someone. Someone came into his office to interview for a job. And he was wearing a t-shirt. He was wearing a t-shirt that says that I love to do expletive. Uh, and this is like on someone's very first day. Again, this is supposed to be where the future of video games is born, and CEO of company is wearing a shirt that says that, that you know, which is obviously not a very welcoming shirt if you are, for example, a woman going to work there. Um, and so, so Nolan Bushnell leaves, and it turns out that Nolan Bushnell, you probably know him, this is coming from a guy who's a father of eight children, he started at Chuck E. Cheese, right? So he has this like really sort of family-friendly environment, and yet, in the early days of the games, like that culture wasn't very welcoming, wasn't very welcoming to women. So he steps down, and this other guy steps in. His name's Ray Kassar. Um, and at the time, there was a, a female game designer there. She's right there on the right. She had made a game called River Raid. Her name was Carol Shaw. And uh, Ray Kassar steps in to take over Atari. And the first thing that he says to this woman, who's a very well seasoned game designer, he says, Oh, at last, we have a female game designer. She can do cosmetics, color matching, and interior interior decorating cartridges. Um, this is the, one of the first female video game developers ever. Um, so these types of environments were very unwelcoming to women, even if they loved games and they wanted to create them themselves. You saw a little bit of progress um, with a game called Defender. Um, 
It's an old 80s game called, uh, called Defender, and it was de designed by this guy named Eugene Jarvis. And he wanted to, he wanted to sort of create an antidote to really, I guess, aggressive games, right? The idea was instead of going out attacking something, he wanted, he wanted to create a game where you would defend something. The only problem is that he wanted the title for the genre he was attempting to create. He wanted to call them sperm games. That was the name in the early 80s. Again, it's like a very gendered sort of uh, depiction of what these games are supposed to be and who they are supposed to attract. Um, this stuff is really important. The reason why I go back to the early history of games rather than the more recent history is because these ways of thinking, um, um, these ways of um, acting around in, in the world of video games runs hand in hand with um, sort of the lack of women who started going into computer sciences, which starts, you see the pivot point, that inflection point is around 1984, which is the same year that a lot of the most famous female game designers actually left the industry. That woman, Carol Shaw, who I mentioned earlier, um, this other woman, Donna Bailey, other female game designers started leaving around this time. And so even though, you know, these other professions, whether it's um, uh, the physical sciences or uh, law school or medical school, where you started to see more parity over the next 20 years, um, computer science was this one region where women started to sort of leave in droves. And there's, you know, again, I've been talking about culture, and the reason, one of the big reasons why is actually the way that sort of computer programming was marketed. Um, this is a, uh, it's a trailer for all you <laughs> Maybe you can tell us who first suggested the idea the movie that came out in 1984. <laughs> Your wife? Very young Matt and Get out. And a promising student. Hi. An old game. Hi. With an electronic twist. Those are great. Yeah. I don't think that I deserve this. Do you? You should put in jail for that. Only if you're over 18. This computer company is coming out with these amazing new games in a couple of months. But I want to play those games. Wow. What? You got something. He found the right code word to play the game. We're in. But it was the wrong computer. Shall we play a game? How can I ask you that? How about mobile, thermal, nuclear, war? All right. Well, so that movie, that movie war games, uh, Obviously, there's something lighthearted about it, and you know, obviously, the good guys win and all that. But the, the messaging for the, for this movie um, was that you know, essentially, that computers can be a tool to to win over that girl that you like in school. That was that was the message that was being marketed, particularly to uh, to young boys and also to young women as well. So these cultural reasons can play a big role in terms of thinking about who actually should be uh, a game designer, who should be someone who works with computers. All right, the last thing. How, how is games as objects, how, do, how they've sort of prevented equality in the world of games. So there's a really good re uh, recent example of this. this. This woman, her name is Dana, Bo uh, Dana Boyd. She's a principal researcher at Microsoft Research. And um, so she, worked, she was one of the early people who worked actually on, on VR in the, uh, the mid-90s as a grad school student. And she had found this research basically um, for military, because military has been very, um, there have been commercial applications of VR, but the military has been really involved in sort of pushing that technology forward. And so she found some research from the military which suggested that women seem to get sick at higher rates in simulators than men. Um, and while they seem to be able to eventually adjust to the simulator, they would get sick again when they switch back into reality. And again, this is just speculative sort of like research. And there are two reasons why. Um, something called motion parallax, which, um, that women are more sensitive to motion parallax. Um, motion parallax is basically you see in the background, that's how you make something in the foreground, the background, even though they're the same size, they sort of give you a sense of distance. And that's something in, uh, in virtual reality seem to, make, uh, seem to make women more sick than men. And also this, uh, this thing called, um, this thing that had to do with basically um, point lighting, basically how you saw lighting in the world. And again, this is all speculative. Uh, and she was very interested in this idea that there was some variability across the board, that biological men were significantly more likely to pri prioritize sort of that motion parallax thing, whereas um, biological women relied more on what was called shape form shading. The point being that there was this discrepancy that she found between the way that men and you know, women approached, uh, approached the virtual reality. And so if this was true, you know, you sort of think about now we have this thing called the Oculus Rift, which is, um, which is a virtual reality headset 
Um, it was started in California um, by a 19-year-old kid who then sold it to Facebook for a billion dollars. And Facebook is really trying to position virtual reality as being sort of this future that we're all going to experience. And yet, there's this potential that at the very core of what virtual reality is, this potential that maybe actually there's a difference um, between men, biological men and women in terms of how they experience this thing that's supposed to be the future. Um, so I don't know, let's say like if I was introducing a VR headset into the public, it seems like something I'd want to explore, right? If this thing that I'm banking billions of dollars on um, has basically a big sort of potential deficiency between, it, it sort of favors one half of the population over the other half, it seems like something that you might want to look into. Um, so there's this moment, um, this happened um, last year, um, this happened at the Oculus Rift, um, they had this big convention, it was called, um, um, it was called Oculus Connect, and they had this future VR, and the people on stage are basically all the big sort of heads of the company, their VP of product, um, the, the founder, their chief technical officer, their chief architect, and chief scientist. And so they got asked about what they think about the role of women is in virtual reality. And this is their response. <laughs> what is Oculus's approach to their clear gender gap and how you're gonna not port that into VR? So I will address this carefully. <laughs> uh, I noted that there were some people online, uh, even an article pointing out that, that Oculus Connect is mostly male. I will point out that in the selection process, there were very few women that applied. It was not that we selected for males, and in fact, women may have actually come out ahead in the selection process by a very slight margin. Um, I'm not 100% sure what we can do. You know, it's, this, is, this isn't a problem with VR. This is something that is widespread in the tech industry, and I don't think that virtual reality has any innate quality that really makes it immediately obvious that we're going to be the thing that has a lot more, you know, women becoming interested in virtual reality and coming to develop our conferences or becoming game developers. Then again, I'm not an expert on this issue. I don't really actually know what the best way to solve it. It's not something I'm. It's not something that I'm. That I'm equipped to do. We are having a hard time hiring all the people that we want. It doesn't matter what they look like. Yeah. And that's that, right? So she asked like a pretty reasonable question. If there are enough women at this conference, and um, you know, what are you planning to do about it? Seems like something that should be important. And it's worth noting, Akos is on my Facebook, and uh, Facebook's COO is a woman, Cheryl Sandberg, and she's made very public statements about how they were gonna be part of this much larger effort towards diversity in terms of in increasing the number of women who work at a company like Facebook. So that's their parent company, and Oculus has, I think it's like, five to 10% women who actually work there. And again, if you go back to what I'm saying, there's this potential that maybe women get more sick from VR, it seems like something that you might want to explore. And the response from essentially the heads of the company is, um, I don't know what we can do about it. Um, that uh, basically women, you know, this, essentially he's suggesting that this is a problem that women can fix for themselves by applying and that we can't do anything about it. And, uh, and then John Carmack, the other guy who spoke, and that's the creator of Doom, which is an incredibly popular game from the 90s, is basically saying that, you know, basically it's not our issue, we just hire the best people. Um, and so this is like a very, obviously there's a real blindness there in terms of thinking about how women can be in the room, especially when there's this sort of like looming potential that, you know, maybe women get more sick from using virtual reality. Um, so, and the reason why this is important is because, you know, science American has found that diversity helps teams solve problems. Um, another good example, so Oculus isn't alone, I think, in terms of this problem. Another good example is Apple's uh, recent health app, which doesn't track your mes menstruation cycle, right? So you have this product that's released to the public, and it doesn't track things that maybe women are interested in tracking, as opposed to things that men are interested in tracking. Um, so there's a term, there's actually a term for this. It's called problem. Um, it's this idea that we need to find solutions in advance by um, bounding deliberately what we're going to look at. Uh, and so if you decide that, you know, if you decide up front that, you know, women are not going to be part of the conversation to create virtual reality, or women are not going to be part of the conversation to create health 
health tracking apps, um, this ultimately will affect uh, this ultimately will affect the kinds of solutions and the types of things that you ultimately create. Um, so there's this sense, you know, I think when I think about this stuff, there's this sort of this big sense of like, what can I do? You know, like um, that little one of the views in the ship, yeah, and below there's this giant wave kind of looming over me. And this is a very common problem with very large problems. Um, Robert Gifford is a professor of psychology and environmental studies at the University of Victoria. And he's argued that when we look at big issues, whether it's sexism or in his case, he was looking at global warming, he said that it leads to this sense of helplessness. So that if I, one, you know, basically the, this perceived lack of behavioral control that, you know, I'm one person, so what can I do about it? The good news is, is that this way of thinking about culture, actually, um, we can use some of these tools, we can actually, it, the games in and of themselves actually have some of the tools to change, um, to change, you know, sort of these really terrible dynamics that we've already developed. Um, so if we go back to this idea that games can shift our thinking, then we can find some solutions as well. Um, so one good, you know, one good company is actually doing a great job, I think, in terms of trying to find better ways to encourage better behavior, changing the way people think, is Riot Games. Um, they're a big uh, PC game maker. They make an online game called League of Legends. It's one of the biggest, what's called esports, um, and they're trying to do this at an institutional level to see that if they can change players' behavior at a very core level. Um, so they they've run a bunch of experiments. Uh, that guy in the center, his name's Jeffrey Lin. He's a lead social systems designer for them, and his job is to figure out how players, can, how he can create systems, social systems, that help people interact. One of the big problems that we have when we engage in online environments is that all the things that humans have learned over, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands of years, we just have thrown all that stuff out the window on places like Twitter or in online games. So one really basic one is uh, that they use is uh, called restricted text chat. So basically. It says that if you're known to be a really negative person online in playing the game, then you don't get to speak as much as other people, which is kind of how it works in the real world, right? Like if you're a total jerk, you don't get invited to stuff, like you don't get invited, people don't invite you over to dinner, you get thrown out of social settings, etc. If you behave the way that you behave online in an offline context, there are actual repercussions. So they're trying to model that, and I think that that's really, really cool. Um, and then they have this other system called the Tribunal. Um, and it plays on this idea of um, altruism, that people collectively want to make decisions together. Um, what they do is they flag negative behavior on behalf of players, and it goes before this. Essentially, it's a volunteer tribunal that sort of decides whether or not your behavior merits any kind of punishment. And this idea that uh, community members want to get together and actually make decisions in themselves, again, very, very new in the world of games. It doesn't exist anywhere else. It plays like Twitter or Facebook, they're the way that they sort of flag things is very much a binary, right? Like we don't collectively participate to decide which people on Twitter or which people on Facebook uh, maybe are not as kind to other people as they probably should be. But that sense of collective responsibility is incredibly, incredibly important. And I think that, um, you know, I think that one of the reasons why you see a place like Twitter has been so negative and been really dangerous, a dangerous place particularly for uh, women, especially women who speak out against, you know, issues of sexism is because they don't have any of these systems kind of built in to help regulate people's behavior. So one question is like, does this actually work? And I don't actually don't think it matters um, because as you know, Yoda says, do or not do, there is no try. The idea is that you know investing in solutions is incredibly important. So if you're building games or anything with a social layer online, you need to think about um, who's participating and how you can protect them and give them the tools to kind of uh, to make their way. So we think about how, how can games change the way that people act. So I, I face this a lot. Um, you know, I think about this a lot. I'm you know I'm someone who's a visible member of the world of games, and um, I think about sort of like what my particular role is. And there's actually a really good I think model for me in terms of like how I as an individual can help use games to affect how people act. Um, it, it, this comes from a 1996 New York Times story. There is an issue in one of South Africa's uh, South Africa's parks with these uh, with these white rhinos that kept turning up dead. And what they found out was that there were a group of juvenile elephants who had come from outside of the park 
they knock them down, and then they basically they gore them to death. <laughs> and all these elephants um, from this other sort of this other this other region, they're all brought here for, as juveniles, and they actually one of the things they didn't have because elephants have this complex social structure is that they, they were lacking some of those some of those elements that would help uh, regulate their behavior. So these younger juvenile elephants, the thing that they were lacking was older elephants. And what the park found was when they introduced older ele elephants into this uh, into this environment, all of a sudden um, you know the, the juveniles started to basically behave in a certain way. And I think that that's a good analogy for sort of what's happened in the world of games, which is that um, you have a bunch of sort of like Younger juvenile folks who are sort of not—they don't have older people that they can look to. They don't have older people maybe who are playing games with them. And some of that's changing, obviously, as the core you know, sort of demographic of games keeps getting older and older and older. But I think that's one of the one of the big problems with games is that you don't have folks like let's say like me who are participating in these environments um, to help younger people think about what it is that they should be doing online. Obviously, it doesn't always work. Um, sometimes, you know, elephants, even when given the right kinds of social structures, they can still be jerks. Um, let's stay on the elephant. In any case, I still think it's incredibly important that those of us who play games, that we help, uh, we help younger folks who are thinking about playing games, how they can sort of situate themselves in this world. The last thing, how can games as objects um, help us engender um, better, uh, more welcoming place for women? Again, um, one way that we can do this, I mean, I think for folks who work in the world of games, is to try to create different experiments that sort of explore some of these larger issues. So this was done by a uh, this was done by a, a team in Spain that uh, basically built a virtual reality experiment where you got to see what it's like to be inside of someone else's body. Um, and I won't show you the whole thing, but essentially, like it goes all the way down to like removing your clothes just to get a sense of like what it is like to be someone on the other side. And it's great because it works It works both ways. It shows men what it's like to be inside of a woman's body and vice versa. Um, so those are the types of experiments that you can do with games that I think are really, really exciting. Anyway, um, so I think, you know, for me, you know, in closing, um, you know, I, I think a lot about this, like this question from this movie, The Thin Red Line, which is like, what difference do you think you can make one person in all of this madness. And I think there's some things that we can learn from a lot of the negative stuff that's happened around games that can help us think um, think more potently about what our sort of future looks like in terms of participating in this community. Um, I think one of the big things, in, you know, is that we should understand that Gamergate uh, and this thing that flared up last fall and continues to live online is that it's not really about games at some level. I actually have a very, very deep level. Um, I think it's sort of a facade in terms of like masking these larger questions about identity. And the reason why is, um, I think comes from this guy, his name's Brendan Nyhan. He's a professor at Dartmouth, and um, he has this really powerful idea, which is that when he looks at, he, he looks specifically at people's like false beliefs. So he looks at some of these, you know, larger issues, like let's say like climate change, for example. And what it turns out is that, you know, sort of your belief in particular issues has less to do with your stated political affiliations, and it has everything to do with your self-identity. What kind of person I am, what kind of person do I want to be, all ideologies are similarly affected. And it's important because I think for people who are, let's say, like pro-gamer gay people, and for people who are anti-gamer gay people, their attachment to this, these types of issues have to do with these larger questions about who am I and who I want to be. Um, and uh, in fact, you know, it's interesting, you know, some of the research that's coming out shows that like even when you present people with facts, um, that actually, <laughs> even if you present them with facts to correct a particular, particular uh, misperception, um, the presentation of facts alone actually makes people sort of more staunchly resistant. So if you tell someone like, hey, sexism is a very real thing in the world of games, let me show you the evidence of this, it actually makes, it does the exact opposite which it makes people sort of like double down and basically stick to their roots. Um, and that's why I think that like when we're having these conversations about things like Gamergate, what we have to do is actually have real conversations that deal with someone's self-identity. Even if you don't really agree with them, um, you have to understand their motivations, understand where it is that they're coming from. 
I think one of the big challenges has been um, with Gamergate has been that you, you have these, this illusion of dialogue that isn't actually real dialogue. Um, this is a visualization that comes from uh, basically two weeks on Twitter, uh, just looking at the Gamergate hashtag. And on the left hand side, you can see the pro Gamergate people, and on the right hand side, you can see the anti Gamergate people. Uh, and all the lines in between are basically the tweets. So uh, as you can see, there's a lot of greens talking to other greens, and a lot of pinks talking to other pinks, but not a lot of dialogue between those two places. Um, the pro Gamergate people tended to do a lot more like retweeting, so finding a statement that someone else liked and then sort of uh, amplifying it, whereas the Gamergate people tend to more often actually sort of, sort of say ostensibly like new things. Um, but the thing that you can see is that neither side is actually really talking to each other. They're not actually having a discussion with one another, even though it can feel sometimes on our life online that everybody's talking about this one particular thing. The reality is actually really, really different. Um, so, you know, I think that cutting through this illusion of dialogue is incredibly, incredibly important. I think one of, the, um, one of the other things that we should remember, I think, when we're looking at gaming culture is that cultures can change over time. And I know it doesn't always feel like that, and I hear you all talking earlier about some of the things, the problems that you see in the world of games, and it can feel like, um, it can feel like nobody's listening. You sort of identify these, like, very large issues, like, well, we need more games that reflect a variety of viewpoints, and we need better distribution, and we just need more people to play games, and there are all these sort of like big, these uh, all these sorts of like big issues. I think it's important to take the long view and understand that cultures can change. Um, one good example is um, soccer. Does anybody? I, I don't watch a ton of soccer, but I did watch the World. Did anybody watch the World Cup? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it happens every four years, and everybody watches it, right? Um, everyone around the world watches it. And there's this element of soccer, when you're thinking about you know, sort of soccer or football, if you will, um, when you're thinking about soccer, you think about the beautiful game, right? Sort of the, the pageantry of the sport and you know, these, like, uh, these sort of the beauty of these different countries engaging, much like the Olympics, the beauty of these countries engaging on this field of, you know, this field of competition. But there's, there's this element of soccer which has been around for quite some time, and that element is hooliganism, right? This is a very, I wouldn't say it's a big part of soccer, but it has its own identity in the world of soccer. That's not what we think when we think about soccer. Um, the first recorded instance of football hooliganism actually happened in the 1880s in England. Um, there was a match between Preston in the North End and Aston Villa. It was a 5 nothing defeat um, um, of Preston. Uh, Aston 5-0, it was a friendly match, which means it wasn't like part of uh, sort of like a larger uh, competition. And, and yet, both teams were pelted with stones, attacked with sticks, they were punched, kicked, spat at. Um, one Preston player was actually knocked unconscious. And all the press reports at the time sort of described the fans as, uh, as howling rough. So this is like activity happens outside of the sport of soccer itself. Uh, and as a result, like, like soccer for a long time had this really nasty reputation um, as being this place where basically where male juvenile violence would happen. And this continued for quite some time, up until about 30 years ago. Um, there's still obviously a lot of problems with hooliganism. You know, racist chance is one of the, a big, big issue. But still, and yet, yeah, billions of people every year participate in this thing called the World Cup which has soccer at its core, but this element of it is still there. But we're able to hold both of those ideas together. The, the reason why I think it's important is because like, with Gamergate, when we have a name for something, then we can address it, and then we can deal with it, and we can contextualize it. And I think that the same way that we can sort of, sort of see the beauty of something like soccer while still recognizing that there is this ugliness that's there is the same sort of hope that I have for all right, one last thing. Um, I, and again, I think this is really hard. This is really hard to remember, especially when people are saying really nasty things. And you know, some of the, some of the examples that I use are really, really terrible. Those examples from Atari, um, you never think of like the makers of Pong sort of engendering this like really nasty environment for basically chasing women out of the world of games. But the creator of Chuck E. Cheese would be, you know, capable of something like that, right? Um, I think it's important to remember that we respond with love and um, that you know. 
ultimately, again, if you go back to the thing I was saying earlier, that if you want to change someone's mind, you have to change their self-identity. And so when we use terms like community, for example, I don't think that has, it, it can't just be the community of people who agree with you, it has to be the community of people who don't agree with you as well. Um, it's incredibly, incredibly important. And, you know, I think, you know, obviously the big reason the civil rights movement worked was because they were able to draw people from all of these different backgrounds. And again, changing that sense of self-identity, um, sort of like looking at segregation as being this national embarrassment, not just a problem that was isolated for, um, for African Americans at the time. And so that's my hope too, that in the world of games, that when we're having these conversations, about what are the roles, what's the role of women, how can we create more, um, more dialogue, how can we create more equity between um, equity in, in this particular industry, that we're trying to attract people, not just the people who sort of agree with us openly, but the people who, who sometimes spit in our face. Um, anyway, I, you know, I'm very hopeful. I think that you know, a lot of all the nastiness I think that's happened in the world of games, I think is incredibly important because I think it helps people understand the um, sort of the breadth of what the problem actually is, and it gives you specific examples. It's not this sort of like passive kind of like women don't feel welcome, but it's a very active um, and sort of active thing and examples that we can point to. Anyway, I, I just want to thank you all for, for having me. Um, I really appreciate it, and uh, let me know. Yeah, if you have any questions, I guess. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you.